701. The preacher quit five minutes early, so we'll, we'll make up for the time. Hey, find you a course book. Turn to page 7, 7 C. 7 C. 7 C in the course book. Y'all have to, I know there's just a few of us, but go ahead and stand up anyway. 7 C. You should know the song. Here we go. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Hey, sing it like you mean it, Art. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. made a hot one too <laughs> hey there's another song on page 9b we hadn't sang this song in a long long time it's called uh, you won't leave here like you came in jesus name do you remember that song you won't leave here like you came in jesus name Bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame For the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name Now you know it, sing it You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name Bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame For the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame. For the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. I guarantee that's going to happen. All right. Hey, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Uh, you've allowed us to come back here on this great Wednesday night, Lord. And I pray right now that you'll bless our pastor once again. Uh, give him the words, Lord, that we need to hear. And we're going to thank you for doing that in advance, Lord. For a lot of people is going to be called out to you tonight, Lord. People that need prayer, need help from you. And so tonight, if you would, would you listen and uh, take care of these needs for these folks, Lord, and just really help them, Lord, to get over whatever's going on in their life. And so we're going to thank you for doing that, too. But most of all tonight, Lord, we're going to tell you this. We love you, and we're going to ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Nobody said good. Say that again. Good evening. Good evening. All right, just want to make sure you were awake. That way, if you're awake, we got something for you. Do have a quick prayer request before we begin the services tonight to... Uh, two of our people, or two of our acquaintances, are in in the hospital tonight. Uh, pray for Brother Ed Bass. Uh, Ed is the brother of Sister B.J. Law. He was taken to the hospital earlier. Um, and not sure what's going on with him, and he's also some delirious and having severe back prob back pain. And so they're trying to figure out what's going on with him. Also, Sister Tressie Lester is still in the hospital. Um, Brother Ed is at TMH, and Sister Tressie is at Capital Regional Medical. Uh, she's in room 633. She's 
she still uh, has some delirium going on. Her sugar went down, and she's she's a lot better shape than she was, but she still she knows who you are, but she can't put pieces together yet. So remember to pray for her and hold her up to the Lord. And also had a report today from Kenya, and we lost five more people uh, out of BBF Africa this past yesterday. And Michael was talking with me about it. He's determined to gather together all that he can get his hands on gospel material, and he's going to where the fighting is so that he can carry the gospel to those there. Unless we get the gospel to them, and if they die without Christ, it's too late then to do something. And you pray for him, that uh, God will take care of him and guide him. And there's nowhere in the world that's any safer than in the will of God, wherever that is for you and me. So you just pray for him and pray. continue to pray for the situation there. Radical Muslim Muslims are coming up out of, out of Somalia. Actually, it's, uh, it's an attack against primarily Christian men um, to stop the flow of Christianity. And Christians are leaving Somalia, coming into Kenya. And, of course, this is payback to Kenya for letting, opening her borders to those that are trying to flee from them. So pray. Uh, that's, the, that's the answer. And, by the way, I, let me say this carefully. Not just prayer. I think repentance ought to happen before we pray. Because we're a nation that needs repenting, folks. Somebody say amen. And I'm talking about Christians primarily. God judges a nation because of his people. So we need to pray that God will help us be what we need to be. And, and that's an encouraging thought. It's not a, not a condemnation. It's an encouraging thought. But it's time we... I feel so pressured. I, I, I was sharing with uh, a brother in the Lord today that I, I feel like this, it's like this thing is almost over and we're kind of dilly-dallying around and playing games, church games. And, and I'm not speaking of everybody. I'm speaking in general. That it has, we have a tendency to think tomorrow's going to be just like today. Well, how long ago? It hadn't been that long ago when we thought tomorrow was going to be just like today. And guess what happened? 9-11 happened. And on and on and on we could go. You need to read a little book called The Harbinger. How many have ever read that book? It's a, it's, it's a massive demonstration of God's results when a nation who's been chosen by God rebels. Israel and America. And you need to take a good close look at seeing it. It's written in a narrative form. It's easy read. But um, anyway, let's, let's put it this way. If, if, as long as we still got time, thank God there's time for repentance and time for God to work. So let's continue to, uh, to pray for each other. And by the way, if you don't have anybody to pray for that you think needs to repent, pray for the preacher. How's that? I need it when nobody else may not. But I promise you, uh, if there's ever been a time when the truth needs to, we need to pay the price for truth, whatever that is, um, then now's the time. And we're in a book in Second John, which primarily is written on that on the thesis of a three threefold understanding of God, and that is truth, first of all, the truth of God, and the love of God, and God's love through His people to His people and then obedience. Those three things are what John's going to talk about. And John's, I believe, is flowing right out of all his other writings, as you well know. You've read the book of the Revelation. You've read the gospel of, of John. And you, you went through First John. We've completed First John, the study in First John. And now we're in Second John. And uh, keeping up, we just determined to go back through. Uh, we've already been through these uh, some months uh, earlier. But I felt the need to go back through there. And so let's... let's at this little book it's only 13 verses um, quick quick thought about what the timing of the book is somewhere between 85 and 95 um, AD according to who you look after the chronological order and uh, the time limit is it was written about the same time all of other John's writings in fact it seems to be almost consistent as they're, as they're placed in scripture here as we told you before uh, the Bible is not arranged chronologically if you'll notice in the uh, in the New Testament, I speak primarily uh, in the New Testament. You do realize that the Book of Romans is not the first epistle that was written. Uh, Galatians is the first epistle, but they were placed in order of size in the Bible. Romans is the largest epistle, and down it downgrades itself. That doesn't do anything to its perfection. It's just the way the people who canonized the Scripture placed it here. 
one of the problems though that we tend to believe we tend to get we tend to think that verses are standalones no verses are uh, in fact there's no such thing as verses in the original there's no numbers in the original there's no there's no there's no chapters there's no verses and one of the reasons that we get tripped up sometimes we try to make a verse stand on itself and hardly any verses can stand on itself it's in a consistent flow with the story that God's talking to us about and giving to us and one of the reasons error is so predominant today as far as erroneous statements and erroneous doctrines are built upon uh, one verse or two verses or verses that are what we call drag and drop theology where you make it put together but God's put this book together just the way he wants us to have it and he's preserved it and so when John begins to write he's writing out of the very inspiration of God he's just the human instrument as all the word of God is by the way I hope I pray that you trust with all your heart on the absolute verbal plenary inspiration of scripture and if you don't, then I promise you, your faith has got to be in something that will not stand. This book has stood the past test of time simply because it's written by the God of all time. And so he's giving this to us through John's, John's heart, his mouth, and his pen. And he starts it off writing just as he does his other, his other writings, except he, doesn't, he never identifies himself. He never says this is John. He usually calls himself the apostle that Jesus loved. And that's usually how he identified himself. He doesn't, and it almost seems like he writes from the third person sometimes. And he does that, I believe, simply because John did not want to call attention to himself. That seems so uh, apropos for any Christian not to want to call attention to ourselves as we want to call our attention to our Lord. And as John writes here, he identifies himself as the elder. As we well know, as we spoke to you about and I still believe that God ordained elder-led churches uh, as with the pastor being an elder and then elders uh, in, in league with the pastor, the pastor being uh, having a different calling than the elders, but the elders have the ability to teach. And the only difference, as we've determined here, is the only difference between an elder and a deacon is an elder has the ability to teach and the deacon doesn't, and they serve. All of us are servants. I'm, I'm the chief servant at Bible Believers Fellowship. That, uh, that's what all of us are here to do. But he identifies himself, and he uses the Greek term here that's used for the office of elder. And he writes in the first verse, let's read down through verse 3, and then we'll stop and make some comments about the, about the book. He says, The elder unto the elect lady. Now, I, I want you to hold on to that thought because there's two avenues of possibilities about the recipient of the book that the book is written to. Many are believed that it was a certain person that he was writing to and um but the word elect here has a uh when he calls her the elect lady um remember one of the reasons that i personally believe he was writing to the church and he when he wrote to the church he wrote it she is the elect lady she's the bride of jesus christ and she's called the body and the bride and the building as we just completed or we're still in the book of ephesians we just working with the church there what we need to understand either way it doesn't change the truth that's here and so if you if you have a commentary or something reading that someone says well we think he was writing to a particular person that doesn't change the truth of the bible or, or the scripture we just need to know that there are two possibilities here and i'm giving you my opinion which isn't worth a nickel it just it's just my opinion so that you might be able to help it i think when i close the last verse it'll help you understand why i believe what i believe about it he says the elder unto the elect lady and her children i believe is speaking of those who were brought into the church of jesus christ those of us that are elect by according to romans 8 28 29 30 elect by the amazing grace of almighty god called and he calls that attention to this that he's about to share get a little forewarning there's not a lot of difference in in what we're going to see as far as the the, the purpose of the writing is what just like first john this was the great day of of the gnostics they those who treated uh, knowledge as uh, special it's, it's like some people who think i have a special insight to god you know you run into these super christians and think nobody's got god's anointing but them and this is the kind of people gnostics were the Gnostics thought they had a real insight to God, and they had this insight that taught that flesh was evil. So they denied the humanity of Jesus Christ. They not only they denied that he was he could not be God and man. 
Now, those two don't go together well. And when you deny Jesus Christ as God and man, you just lost the possibility of salvation because Jesus Christ had to be human and he had to be divine. The reason he had to be human and he had to be born of a virgin is he had to be a perfect sacrifice for you and I to have eternal salvation. There is no salvation without a perfect sacrifice that doesn't need a repetitive sacrifice on every day of atonement. And so when, when we see this knowledge that they, they, they say they have acquired special interest groups, then he's going, to, he's going to decry false doctrine. Listen to me carefully. It's an amazing fact that if we have truth and, and there are those who are teaching outside that truth era, then somebody's wrong. Say amen. You can't, you, can't have two, you can't have two rivers flowing from the same stream and both be pure and if they're divided. It's because there'll be contradictions and there'll be collections. And so that's what John's going to do. He's going to warn them about the Gnostics and about those who come in. And by the way, here's what was happening basically is the, these, these people would come into the church and usually these were house churches and they would mingle with the people and they were, they were really leaning heavily on, on showing um, counterfeit affection to these people and win their confidence. And of course, by winning their confidence then they'd, they would listen to their, their theological or philosophical rather uh, thoughts and they would share those with them and of course they were literally pulling them away from the faith and that's what he was warning about he said now beginning there in verse one let me finish down to verse three and then we'll finish some comments on it he said i want to write to this elect lady and her children whom i love in the what the truth here's something he used the word truth five times in the first four verses and the word is pistos. It literally means divine truth. It means truth that there's no, there's no fringe of error in. And remember, he uses a definite article before truth. The truth. What did Jesus say about him being the what? The way, the truth, the truth. Not a truth, not a way, not a life, but the life. The definite article. There are those who disagree. And John uses that article constantly when he speaks of Christ. In fact, in the Gospel of John, we told you earlier, where he says, uh, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. There, and actually, if you read that in the Greek, there's a definite article before the word God, and the cults that would say he's a God. No, there's a definite article there that said he's the God. So he's not a God, he's the God. Amen? And by the way, if Jesus Christ isn't God, there's no hope for salvation. Just like Him being human. He has to be human to be a sacrifice. But He has to be God to be a perfect sacrifice. Without spot or wrinkle and without infection as the high priest would take that sword and strip the bones apart and make sure there was no infection in Him. There was no fault found in Him, declared by Pontius Pilate. But He says that I, have, I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known, here we go again, the truth. Here's what he's doing. He's telling us that there's, love is a vital thing. It flows from God. But love never abrogates truth. There are those who, who get this, well, we're, we're to love everybody. No, we're not. We're to love those who are in the truth. We're to love the body of Jesus Christ. But we can't love everyone who claims the name of Jesus and yet magne uh, maligns his truth. And here's why. We're going to face that a little bit further. He's going, he's going to be so stringent that he was, he's going to say, these people that come and bring this error, don't even associate with them. Don't invite them into your home. Don't have them, don't have a meal with them. He's, he's setting apart those who claim to be and those that are. We need a discerning spirit in our age. Very discerning spirit. Because everybody that says I'm a Christian is not. Somebody say amen. And that saddens my heart. I wish they all were. And by the grace of God, if we keep preaching the truth, that's the only possibility anybody has enough. You do know that God is not going to use a false gospel to call true Christians. He's going to use the true gospel. And that's when salvation occurs. And that's why John is so stringent on truth. He says, and not only I, but also all that have known the truth, we love you. That's what he's saying. All that know the truth. Someone gave an illustration that I like. I believe Bible truth, Bible love, flows is like a river that flows down between two banks. And the, both of those banks on each side are truth. And Bible love flows right down through the center. Emotionalism, spectacularism, and all the other isms 
fit outside of that to make it appear like it's real love. You ever been around people that act like they love you until they get out of your sight? Well, that's what he's, he's saying here. Those that love the truth are the people that we love, who we can love. And then he says in verse 4, excuse me, verse 2, For the truth's sake, let me read that together because we get a separation here. He said, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth where? There's the truth. There's the truth. It dwelleth in us and shall be with us. How long? I love those words, those all-inclusive words that you can't abrogate. You can't, you can't undefine them. You can't change them. How long is forever? Um, well, actually, it's open on both ends. You know, there's no such thing. Eternity is open on both ends. So he says, the love of God is going to stay with us forever. Romans 8 but makes it very plain that the latter part said nothing can separate us from what? Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It's an eternal thing. I like the word eternal, don't you? You know why everything on this earth is temporary. Have you ever figured out why we're so busy trying to mess with stuff that's going to burn? Does that make sense? I'll never forget riding with a young Christian one. His name was Otis Tennell. Um, Otis got saved, and we were out riding around. And so I think the preacher at that, that time had mentioned something about when Jesus comes, you know, most of the earth, a good part of the earth is going to burn up. And we were riding around in one of the rich communities out in an area, and we went by this house, and I said, well, that's a big old house, isn't it? He said, yeah, my goodness, a lot. He said, but you know what? That thing's going to burn one day. Here he is, maybe a month old in the Lord, and he's already understanding that this, whatever we have, by the way, Thank God for temporariness sometimes. I'm glad I've got a temporary house to live in. Amen. I'm glad I've got a temporary. I'm drawing breath temporarily. But I'm glad I got it. So he's reminding us, though, that this thing is eternal that we have in Jesus Christ forever. And then he says in verse 3, he gives an introduction a little bit different than most times. He says, grace. I want to stop a minute on grace, folks. If it wasn't for there, we wouldn't be here tonight. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Is God giving us what we can't deserve. But God could not exercise grace before another element of God's awesomeness appears. Let's read the rest of it. Grace be with you. Mercy and what? Peace. Mercy. Justice called, mercy answered. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. My goodness alive. Had God not withheld judgment, he couldn't have extended grace. He withheld what we had coming and gave us what Jesus paid for us. I don't know about you, but if I wasn't 73 plus years, I'd run. That don't excite y'all a little bit? You, your exciter needs to be turned over or something to think about how God's worked in your life. And then, by the way, the results, he gives us that. The results of grace and mercy is what? Peace. Where does it come from? From God. It doesn't come from uh, having, a, having a big CD account. And by the way, it doesn't come from having a, uh, anything on this earth. It comes from God. If He extends mercy, He gives us grace and peace. By the way, this is a peace that passes understanding. People can't understand how people can be in the midst of everything in the world. And there seems to be just this re resolved to the will of God. That's what brings peace. Resolve for the will of God. And he says, And peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth. Now he adds this, and love. What we're going to see is he's going to tell us that, that without truth, without biblical truth, there's no such thing as biblical love. That's why he's trying to define it up front. So we get it when we get to the point where he's going to give us some standards that seems a little bit strenuous when you first look at them and it says, oh my goodness, it seems like we're almost being antisocial. Well, we should be to the world. You know one of the problems? Most Christians today like the world more than they like the spiritual part of God. Have you ever figured, I was talking to a guy the other day, said, and I said, well, what do you think about the Bible? You know, and he, was, he, I, I was, he said he didn't believe in God. Well, I knew that he was going to say, well, I don't really believe in the Bible either. And he said, oh, that's just a book some old men wrote, you know. And, and I understand. I used to think the same way. 
And I said, well, just suppose, just suppose that that is the Bible, the Word of God, and there is a real God. Just suppose. And you're betting your eternity that there's no God. You know, the truth of the matter is, if there's no God, I don't have anything to lose. Guess what? If I'm right, you got everything to lose. Think about that. That's what he's bringing us to. Truth is where we enter through. The gate of heaven is barred. Error can't get through. Only truth will make it through. And so he tells us in verse 4, he said, I rejoice greatly, excitedly, that I found of thy children walking where? Not preaching the truth, not teaching the truth, but doing what? Walking in truth. As we have received, by the way, that word walking carries with it a, uh, that we keep talking about the present participle, which is a con causes repeated or continuous action. It means that they didn't just start walking, they're continuing to walk in the truth. Don't you like people that start with stuff and stay with it? Amen. That's what he's talking about. People who start with the truth and walk in the truth. And he says they were walking in the truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. And he said, now this is a shared truth Every believer is to walk in that truth, not just proclaim the truth, not just acknowledge the truth, not just say the truth, but live it. Isn't that a wonderful word? That's good preaching, hard living. I can see your face now. It is, it's easier to, do, easier to say than it is to do, isn't it? But it's not impossible because the God of all truth lives in us. I love what John says a little bit later, or he said it back over in his, in his, in his first epistle here first part of his epistle when he said this he said I, you don't need that I write write the truth to you you have the truth living in you and you know all things it's like the spirit of God lives in us and not one of us can do wrong without being reproved before we do it that's the wonderfulness of the truth he reproves us before so he says it's exciting to me to see know your children walk in the truth and he says and now I beseech thee lady not as though I wrote, I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that's which we have had from the beginning. And here's what it is, that we agape, that we love one another. There's no more beautiful word in the world, in my opinion, than real love. And the word here is that love that's a God kind of love that only God can, God can give to love. And I believe that God gave us that are His he gave the ones, remember, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. But don't overlook the simplicity of that statement. I can say it this way. We are able to love like he loved because he loved us first. And he gave us the kind of love. Have you ever wondered how you can love some people that you love? Have you ever wondered how anybody could love you? Now, that's easier to get to. Amen. Think about that. He, no, I, I, I was overwhelmed when I re when I understood God loved me and I'm still overwhelmed with that to think about God loving somebody who didn't even believe he existed but the love of God is directed by the spirit of God and is always housed in by the truth of God and that's what he's saying here he says I beseech thee lady as though I wrote I didn't write a new commandment here's that old commandment I want to remind you about and uh, let me tell you something else you don't love people with your mouth. You love them with your life. It's a, love is a... You know what love is like? It's like climbing up in the tree and giving everyone you love the salt. Do what you want to do. I'm going to love you anyway. Whew. Everybody's getting quiet. It is not an easy thing, but is it, it's not impossible or God wouldn't tell us to do it. Amen? We know that we can do it. And so he says this, and he says that we're to love one another, and this, he's, then he gives us a description here, and this is love, that we walk after his, we do what? We walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Uh, truth, someone asked me years ago, what do you believe? And I thought about that, and I, I started rattling off something, and I said, wait a minute. I truly believe this with all my heart. 
I can tell you what I, what I think I believe, but I can tell you the best way to know what I believe. Watch how I live. That's, how, that's what you really believe. Not what you give acquiescence to not to do this or that or the other. It's what you really believe. It's what you live. Not what you give verbiage to. And then he says, so that you could walk in it. He says in verse 7, I want to tell you why I'm telling you these things. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. They were denying His humanity again. He could not be who He claimed to be because of their foundational understanding. They had this thing from God, this insight to God that flesh was evil and there was no way that He could be human. So He says, those who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh... This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, I need to tell you, this is one of the ways to define cults. They will not accept Jesus Christ as the God. They will, do, they will undeify Him in every way possible. They will make Him a God. They will make Him a prophet. They will make Him a teacher. But they will deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And the second thing they normally will do they will either cool off or try to remove hell. Those are the, one of the two primary ways you can identify that which is not, no matter what the politicians say about Mormonism, it's a cult. You can say amen or oh me, it's still that. They deny Jesus Christ and who He is. I'm not picking on the people. I don't attack people, but the doctrine stinks. Somebody say amen with it. You need to, folks, let me tell you what, if you're afraid to say what's true, then you got a problem. You really do. And I don't mean to ever try to use this to beat people up over the head. That's not the idea. But I promise you, if you really believe this book, you're going to have to be against some things. And, uh, and not just to be against, but because the Word says so. Say amen. And here's why I want you to say amen. You need to get a hold of some things. And we need, we need some God backbones again that will say, you know, this is wrong according to the Word of God. Love people, but tell them the truth. That's what we need to do. I don't, I don't believe in this hammering and beat. I don't believe in what they call hate language. Uh, and, of course, anything that isn't pro-politician is hate language. That's all right. We'll go to jail together, right? <laughs> he said, They have many deceivers who entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ. And he says, These are deceivers and an antichrist. They are against Christ. That's what the word anti means. And this is not the antichrist. This is one of his followers. And then in verse 8, he says, Look to yourselves. That's the subject of this whole book. Check out what you believe. Make sure you're in agreement with God. That's truth. Look to yourselves. Self-examination is a scary thing. Let me ask you a question. You, you ever do that about your spiritual life? My goodness, we need to take inventory. Where, where do I stand on this issue? Where am I at on this issue? What, what kind of validity do I have? Why do I believe what I believe? Do I believe it because it's what I want to believe, or do I believe it because I can validate it in the Word of God? Where do I stand? Do I, do I choose to believe something from a call or whatever? So here's what he says. Look to yourselves that we, inclusive, Lose not those things which we have wrought or which we have earned or gained, but that we receive a full reward. Now here's the scary part. He says, the reason I want you to look to yourselves is how we, we are held accountable for how we handle truth. Let me tell you a scary thing about being a teacher or a pastor teacher or whatever. God holds us responsible for what we teach. To me, that's scary. And he holds you responsible for what you hear taught. If it can't be validated scripturally, then you need to shed it off. Don't embrace it. But he says, look to yourself so that we can receive a full reward. Here's why this is so important. There's never been a day that, we, that people are running after feel-goodism. 
They're running after entertainment. Make me feel good. Uh, I believe that they think that this book is actually what God gave us so that we'll know what to do to make Him do for us what we want to. That is not the reason this book is here. This book is here to direct us as to what we're to do to bring glory to God. We are not the center. He is. But we've made man the center in our humanistic ideas of Christianity itself and espoused all kind of garbage to make people think, well, this is, boy, this is great. This is what I want. And here's the thing. I believe God has a plan. And as long as we subscribe to that plan, and here's that plan, that we glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's it. And if my life is not built around that, if it's centered around me, then guess what? I'm in trouble. And I have a feeling, uh, let me say we're in trouble. And I don't have a mouse in my pocket. How's that? That means any of us that embrace those wrong. I'm going to stop there. you have any questions about what we we're, what we're said? We're going to stop in verse 8. And we'll pick up there, the Lord willing, Sunday night. Do you understand that, that the premise of all the Bible is this? But more than anything else, I believe as John got closer to seeing the revelation of who Jesus Christ was, and by the way, this is right at the same time God's going to open the door and show him all that Christ is. He majors on truth, truth, truth. The Laodicean church that God gave him understanding about in chapter 3, the book of the Revelation, it was a church, our church age, the one we're living in. It was a church that was ruled by the people. The people, that's what the word Laodicean means. It means rule of or voice of the people. The people were in charge, and that's why Jesus was standing out the side in Revelation 3.20, knocking on the door of the church, wanting inside of his own church, because the church was ruled by humanism. I'm convinced that's the greatest enemy today is humanistic Christianity that makes us what we're not and denies who God really is. So hold on to that truth. Amen? I'm glad this book is true and every man alive. Anybody have any questions? Everybody understands the first eight verses of Second John? Good. We'll move right on to the next one, the Lord willing. All right. Brother Tony, if you'll come and take uh, prayer request. Do remember to pray for so many that I know we'll have requests. We've got a lot of people that are sick, and we did have a good report though uh, tonight coming in, a good one, and then one that we need to pray about. But uh, Brother Laura is doing a lot better. His surgery went good. He did well, and then on top of it, uh, his wife was so stressed she got a stress fracture in one of her feet. We got to pray about that. Brother Silas came through his eye surgery great, and uh, he goes back to the doctor tomorrow to get the bandage removed. So uh, God's still working, amen? And uh, so many things that we need to attend to. I, I do want to share this one thing. But let's do whatever we got to do to get out of the way so God can work. We just need whatever that is in your life, in mine, just get out of the way. Because if we don't get out of the way, God will push us out of the way. But he is going to work in these last days because it's, it's here. We're, we're at, the last days aren't coming. They're here. And what we do from now to the time we're caught out of here is all there is. That's it. It'll be over the day, he says in Revelation 4.1, come up hither and we're out of here. And the sad part, the truth goes with us except that which is restrained, restrained for the Jews during the tribulation period and those who have never heard the gospel. Here's one glorious fact that I love. There will be more people saved during the tribulation period than there have been since the beginning of the church, in my opinion. And not one, though, who has ever heard the true gospel before will have a second chance. And that's the scary part. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 makes that plain. Okay, brother. Ah, the lights are off.